Hi everyone, welcome to the fourth and final video for module eight where we're talking about models with a single categorical predictor. In the last video, we talked about situations where we have more than two groups and we walked through how we could treatment code those variables or contrast code those variables. And ultimately we get a similar omnibus F but we get different coefficients. And the reason for that is that our models are converging on the same estimates, but they're getting there in slightly different ways, right? Both models, whether it's treatment coded or contrast coded, are going to end up predicting the mean for each group, which means we'll get the same sums of squared errors and the same omnibus F test, but we'll get there in slightly different ways. In this video, we wanna talk a little bit more about what that actually means and walk through the equations step-by-step step so that you can see that the, the math actually works out, basically. So we had this uh, situation at the end of the last video where we were looking at our two different sets of results and we said that even though the individual coefficients were different between the treatment codes compared to the contrast codes, we had the same proportional reduction in error for the overall model, the same omnibus F test and the same P value for that F test across both situations. And the reason for that, right, is that we're doing a model A, model C comparison in which we're comparing an intercept, uh, a slope and a second slope, right, uh, to a uh, model C that is just the intercept. So we're asking how much do these two slopes, these two coefficients as a set improve the prediction of our model. Now, the actual coefficients differ, right, as we see in the treatment codes compared to the contrast codes, but the estimates that you get out of this model will be the same whether we use the uh, coefficients and the treatment codes here or whether we use the coefficients and the contrast codes here. And because those estimates ultimately wind up being the same, that means the sum of squared errors for model A is the same in both of these situations. Model C is obviously the same because we're just estimating an intercept for everyone. And then the model A, model C comparison yields the same result, right? For an F with two and 18 degrees of freedom, we get 8.996, uh, which is st statistically significant, uh, assuming we had set our alpha threshold at 0 0.05. So why exactly does this happen? You know, how can we have different models that make the same set of predictions? Well, let's start with our model, right, for our treatment codes here at the top and our contrast codes down here at the bottom. Again, the intercepts are different because what x equals zero means is different in these two models, right? In this case, x is zero in the fast group, uh, whereas in this case, x is zero on average across all levels of the factor. So, so here we have uh, the intercept is actually a prediction. It's one of our uh, group means in the model, whereas down here, the, uh, the intercept is just the grand mean. It's the mean of all the data. So then we want to look at the, how do these other uh, coefficients actually lead to get us getting the same predictions in these different models. And to do that, we can actually start plugging in values to see what we arrive at. So we can start with our fast group. Okay, so in the treatment coded case, the fast group is coded as zero on both X1 and X2. In the contrast coded case, the fast group was coded as one in X1 and negative one in X2. So we multiply those values by their respective coefficients. We do the addition across and we wind up with an, uh, a, a prediction for the fast group of 68.5, right? Which again is the mean of the fast group. So for everyone in that fast group, we're going to have the same numerical prediction. We are going to estimate the mean, which means we'll get the smallest sum of squared errors within that group. Similarly, for the medium group, right, in the treatment coded case, they had a one for X1 and a zero for X2, whereas in the contrast coded case, they had a zero for X1 and a two for X2. So if we multiply those values by their respective coefficients and then add it up across, we get 61.75 in both situations, right? And again, that's the mean for people in the medium speed group, right? People who had sort of average 800 meter sprint times. And we're gonna estimate the mean in that group, which means for that group, we'll get the smallest sum of squared errors. Finally, uh, we have our slow group, right, who were coded as zero and one in the treatment codes, and we're coded as negative one and negative one in the contrast codes. So if we multiply those values by their respective coefficients and then add everything up, we get a prediction, which is 57.960, which is the mean of people in the slow group. So we, we, we end up with three different predictions that everyone's going to get. If you were in the fast group, we will predict the mean of the fast group for you. If you were in the medium group, we will predict the mean of the medium group for you. If you were in the slow group, we'll predict the mean of the slow group for you. And we get exactly the same predictions whether we use treatment codes or dummy codes. And the reason for that is because these coefficients are all determined using least 
squares estimation. As such, we're going to uh, uh, estimate coefficients, or sorry, we're going to we're going to fit coefficients that lead to the mean being estimated for each group. Right? The individual coefficients differ based on what our codes are, but because we used least squared estimation, we're always going to end up with estimates that produce the smallest sum of squared errors. So the math will force these coefficients to give us the means of the different uh, of the different groups. And ultimately, that's going to give us the smallest sum of squared errors in each group. And as a resu result, have, we'll have a model that produces the smallest sum of squared errors. Um, so then we have model A's, right, that, that ultimately make the same predictions and ultimately have the same SSEA in both cases. And then we just need to compare those model A's to our model C's, right? We can calculate a proportional reduction in error. We can calculate an F observed. And we can decide, do those two predictors as a set explain statistically significant variation in our outcome variable? Now, we can see this, right, that um, in, in the uh, the statistical output again. I've just I've just kind of cut out the uh, coefficient details so we can focus in on the omnibus f statistic at the end, right? To show that again the the r squared, the proportional reduction in error, right? The f statistic, the degrees of freedom, and the p value are the same whether we use these treatment codes or these dummy codes. And the reason for that is because we ultimately have a model A that makes the same prediction. It's always going to predict the mean of each group for everyone in that group which means we're going to have the same sums of squared errors out of either model, right? Whatever we used for our codes, as long as we used an appropriate contrast code or an appropriate treatment code, we will get predictions that uh, give us the mean, or we'll get predictions of the mean of each group. We can calculate the sums of squared errors, which will allow us to make a model A, model C comparison and obtain the same omnibus F and proportional reduction in error. However, the individual contrasts are different, and that's important to keep in mind. Not only because you know it means that we have to, uh, when we interpret these contrasts, we have to think about well, what were they coded as, and what does this contrast actually mean? But because we have to think about what happens after we calculate that omnibus f statistic. The omnibus f statistic is going to be the first thing we want to look at, and then if it is statistically significant, we can go and dig into these codes in a little bit more detail. Now the book has talked about this a little bit, and we're going to spend a little more time talking about it in the lab. Um, but the, the conceptual thing to understand here is that once we start having more than two groups in our models, if we want to compare different groups to each other, that means we're making multiple comparisons. And multiple comparisons can be a problem because it will increase our false positive rate. So for instance, consider uh, that we talked about for a single test, we'll often want to set the false positive rate at 5%. We'll set alpha to 0.05. Now, if we wanted to test each of our groups compared to each other, we'd have a comparison of the slow to the medium group, the medium to the fast group, and the fast to the slow group. So that's three different tests that all have a 5% false positive rate, which means that the family-wise false positive rate is now 15%. Uh, and, and what we mean when we say family-wise, so that's within a family of statistical tests, which is to say a, a, a family is a group of statistical tests that are conceptually related. They're asking questions about a similar hypothesis. right? So often this will be about the effect of a given variable, um, but, but but, and, and as we get into um, ANOVAs with multiple variables in them, um, the definition of sort of a family of tests will become a little bit more clear. But in our case, right, if we wanted to ask about the effect of your speed, right, how fast you ran the 800 meter dash on the uh, VO2 max times, that's three different groups. Um, which means there are three different comparisons that we could make. So this is a family of tests. It is the effect of speed on your VO2 max times. When we looked at this continuously, right, we didn't have this problem because continuously there was just one parameter. There was a linear relationship between VO2 max times and speed. So we didn't have a multiple testing problem. But now we've taken this continuous variable, we've broken it up into three groups. If we actually want to test all the different groups relative to each other, now we have a multiple testing problem because our family of tests actually has three different tests in it. So how do we get around that? Well, one thing that we can do is not interpret those individual comparisons until we actually look at the omnibus F. Because if we look at the omnibus F first, that allows us to control this family-wise error rate. Right? We can actually look at the F. In our case, we had 2 and 18 degrees of freedom. Right? When we put everything in together, we can look at the omnibus F and we can run one test. And we can say, OK, do we see a statistically uh, large reduction in error that we think would be statistically unusual under the null hypothesis? And if we set our alpha level to 5%, 
and the P on the omnibus F is less than 0.05, we would say, yeah, it looks like as a set, these predictors are uh, explaining more variance than we would have predicted by chance under the null hypothesis, right? This is a, a statistically interesting reduction in error that we wouldn't have expected due to sampling variability alone, assuming that the null hypothesis is true. So there's something systematic, we think, probably going on in our data. Once we've done that, now we've controlled our false positive rate at, at 5%, and we, we would be more justified to go in and look at these individual um, comparisons. However, right, we still have a concern because then we're still making multiple comparisons um, once we once we dig into that variable. It's not so bad if we only have three groups, right? But now imagine if we had had five groups or six groups. The the overall F might might have been statistically significant, but should we trust all of our individual comparisons? The more comparisons we make, the more likely some of them are to be false. Um, so the issue of correcting for multiple comparisons um, in 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 detail is a bit more of an advanced topic. We're going to deal with it in sort of a more conceptual way and just think about, okay, what can we do to try and reduce our chance of getting a false positive by controlling the family-wise error rate? And one of the first important things is we don't want to place too much weight on these individual contrasts or these individual comparisons between groups unless we have a statistically significant omnibus F because that F right has a consistent false positive rate. And we're not going to inflate it by just running that one F test and then going and, and looking at our com uh, comparisons between groups. So if this omnibus F is statistically significant, then we are justified to go in and interpret the individual contrasts and possibly conduct any additional post hoc tests that we feel need to be done. Um, but we still want to be cautious about multiple comparisons in our data. And this is true if we're looking at uh, variables that have lots of levels, right? So we're unpacking an omnibus F test and we have a lot of different comparisons to make. But it's also going to be true if we think about it rather than the family-wise error rate, we might have an experiment-wise error rate. Right, so in, in this case, I might look at uh, my three groups and VO2 max test, but what if I also threw in resting heart rate as a variable and body composition as a variable, um, and and you know maybe uh, forced ventilatory volume as a variable, right? So so we could actually have 20 different dependent variables uh, in our study, and now we've all of those are different families of tests, right? Because we are testing the effect in each different variable, but the experiment-wise error rate, which is to say the number of statistical tests we've run across the whole experiment, has gone up. So we're always going to want to be cautious about our false positive rate and take steps to not inflate it, right? And not run any more statistical tests than we have to. And, and in subsequent videos, we'll talk about how we can actually make corrections in here uh, to, to keep the family-wise false positive rate down. But the first step, right? The first step is always going to be to look at that omnibus F first, test first. If it's not statistically significant, we're not going to dig into those individual paired comparisons unless we have a very good reason based on a theory or previous data.